Hello. Thanks, Peg. Um, this is such a treat. It's so fun to, um, um, you know, go to work, like to give a reading, but get to listen to everybody else. So thank you guys, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the other readers, too. Um, I would like to read to you from this newest book. Um, the other novelists in the room are going to appreciate how rare it is to be able to be invited to a reading and have something to read that's neither dusty nor raw because as novelists it takes such a long time to you know pull a book off that often we're either reading things that we've you know written a long long time ago or things that we're you know still working on and so it's nice to have a book just out huh, again <laughs> it is, yeah. and um, this book is uh, about um, an aging Shakespeare scholar who is struggling with dementia. And um, as those of you who know people who are struggling with dementia may have discovered, one of the things, some of the things people lose last are either things they've learned by heart or those early, early memories. And so, what would it be like? to know Shakespeare by heart and have that as, the, as sort of the, the final lens with which to see the world is, is sort of one of the questions this novel asks. And of course, people have work to do to the very ends of their lives. And one of the things that he may or may not be able to pull off is a reconciliation with a daughter from whom he's been long estranged. Um, there's another aspect of this book too, though, which I think it's a it's it's a building's roman. It's it's a story of his education, and so the little bit that I would like to read to you um, sort of uh, follows that theme. In this scene, um, the protagonist is in eighth grade, and he's just finished diagramming sentences. And the substitute teacher has said, and he's 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 you know he's good at that. So he diagrammed the sentences very quickly, and the substitute teacher said, uh, "Read this book." And she grabs, she just pushes a book at him. It is a small volume, sturdily bound with faded red fabric. Lifting the color cover releases the heady scent of aged paper. A smell that reminds him of the trunks in his grandmother's attic and the odd old treasures they contain. The book contains a play he sees when he flips past the title page. He pauses to peruse a list of unfamiliar names under the strange heading Dramatis Personae. But it all makes so little sense that, rather than trying to understand, he turns the page to read the first line of dialogue, which is spoken by a character called Ant. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. And before John can stop to wonder why an ant might speak those words, something is flaring inside him like the fireworks he and his friends set off on the riverbank outside of town on midsummer nights. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. He has no idea what sooth is, or maybe where it is, since it seems to be a thing that one can be in, like San Francisco or a bathtub. But he recognizes what it means to be sad and not know why. Forgetting the blackboard with its rows of sentences to be flayed, forgetting his brash, dull, or callous classmates, forgetting even the pretty substitute who is sitting now with her hand cradling her neck and her head tucked to one side, he reads the next few lines. It wearies me. You say it wearies you. But how I caught it, found it, or came by it, what stuff tis made of, whereof it is born, I am to learn. It is both comforting and disconcerting to think of sadness as something he might catch or find, like a head cold or a coin. 
like Ant, John too longs to learn what stuff his sadness is made of, whereof it is born. He keeps reading, the words opening inside him like blossoms or bombs or gift horses. <laughs> And such a want, wit, sadness makes of me that I have much ado to know myself. A want, wit, that's what he is, smart enough to diagram the Gettysburg address, but sometimes so stunned by sadness that he too has much ado to know himself. He wonders exactly what that means, much ado. And he wonders why it is so hard for a person to know himself. Recently, in a rare attempt at intimacy, he confided to his brother how hard it was to know what he should do or even be. He would said he could see how he might try to please their dad by trying out for football or joining the baseball team, but it didn't seem like it would be the real John who was doing those things. He'd added that he wondered how he could still be himself if he were to change like that. And he wondered if that other football playing John wouldn't also find himself confused about who he was. Confused about who you are? Herb had scoffed when John finished talking, punch punching John's shoulder so hard he left a bruise. He said, you're a person, you germ. Get over it. The girls in the, front, in the row in front of him are engaged in a whispered conversation concerning a member of the varsity football team when John turns the book over to read the title embossed on its faded red spine, The Merchant of Venice, and the author, William Shakespeare. Shakespeare kick in the rear. That's the game they used to play at recess back in grade school. One boy ambling innocently alongside another on the playground, and then shooting a foot out to land a blow on the unsuspecting kid's bottom. Back then, John hadn't really known what Shakespeare was. Like all the other words whose meanings he'd had let yet to learn, it was just a set of sounds with its attendant cluster of apt or outrageous connotations. Shake, spear. To his second grade thinking, it had made a sort of wicked sense that a kick in the rear could be the outcome of a shaken spear. But now that he's in junior high, he knows that Shakespeare is one of those famous authors who lived long ago, like Charles Dickens, Jane, what's her name, or Edgar Allan Poe. He knows that in high school he will read Shakespeare, just as he knows he will someday study geometry and dissect a frog. Sitting in his eighth grade class, he feels smug to be reading Shakespeare so soon. He returns to the play where someone named Sal is talking about argosies and burgers and woven wings, and John is dismayed to find the lines make little sense. Flipping back to the Dramatis Personae page, he learns that ant is not an insect at all, but a man named Antonio, a merchant of Venice, and that Sal is Antonio's friend, Solario. One of the salads, John thinks now, with an insider's satisfied nod, as he recalls how actors refer to those two interchangeable characters, Solario and Solanio. And the boy, John was back in his salad days, reads what Solanio has to say next. Had I such venture forth, the better part of my affections would be still with my hopes abroad. I would be plucking grass to know where sits the wind, peering in maps for ports and piers and roads, and every object that might make me fear misfortune to my ventures out of doubt would make me sad. John has only the dimmest inkling of what Solanio might mean, but he still wants to know why Antonio is so sad, and so he presses on. It seems he is bursting with feelings that need to be shared, 
questions and ideas that ache to be asked or understood. But still Herb thinks he is a germ. Still the other kids in his class are clueless. Still the grown-ups at home are tired, preoccupied with taxes and mortgages and the neighbor's broken fence. I hold the world but as the world, a stage where every man must play a part and mine a sad one. Alone in that crowded classroom, John feels those lines like a kick in the rear, like the suck of some great tide. He hasn't known there are words for what he feels, hasn't known there is anyone who might diagram his sadness, much less that it was William Shakespeare. <laughs>